Hello, hello. We are back. This is Medical Monday. I am Dr. Frida, and we are here bringing you medicine in the news, where we talk about all of the hot health topics in the headlines. We've got some great topics today. We are going to be talking about Halle Berry. Halle Berry, Halle Berry. Did y'all see her in the news? She said that she was diagnosed by her doctor with the worst case of herpes her doctor had ever seen. But here's the gag. It was a misdiagnosis. She did not have herpes. She actually is just going through perimenopause. So we'll talk about herpes and the actual symptoms of that STI versus perimenopause, which most women eventually will go through. And then we're going to talk about the new TikTok craze, if you've heard about it. It's called Oat Zempic. Yes, O-A-T Zempic, where they say that if you mix oats, lime juice, and water, it's just as good as Ozempic. Mm, I don't think so. But we'll get into it. And we'll talk about that TikTok craze, the do's, the don'ts, the pros, the cons. And then we'll actually talk about Ozempic because the actor and comedian Tracy Morgan is talking about how to laugh and lose because he shares that he uses Ozempic. So we'll talk about the actual indications for Ozempic and how it differs, differs from the oat Zempic. And then we'll talk about alcohol. We'll talk about alcohol because studies show that alcohol can increase the risk for cancer, specifically in women, excessive alcohol use and even moderate alcohol use can increase your risk for breast cancer. And so not only that, other cancers as well. And there's some celebrities who've come clean about being clean from alcohol, including Anne Hathaway and Tiffany Haddish. Yes, Tiffany Haddish is sober. So we'll get into all of those topics and we might have a few more topics for you as well. So stay tuned, stay with me, come right back. This is Medicine in the News. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Frida. This is Medicine in the News. I am a medical doctor who has been multi-board certified. I've been certified in pediatrics, internal medicine, nephrology, which is a study of kidneys and high blood pressure. And I have also been board certified in obesity medicine. Today, we're not talking about my board certifications. We're going to talk about some of these hot medical topics. So let me invite my co-host up, who's also my practice manager, Shador. Hey, that's Hello. Frida. Hey, how are you doing today, Shador? I'm pretty good. How are you? Good, good. Did you have a good Easter weekend? I did. How about yourself? We had a good one. We went up to Stone Mountain, you know, Stone Mountain here in Atlanta, which means I had to I had to wake all the kids up at four something in the morning. And so we had a few attitudes until we got to the mountaintop. And then we had a, a wonderful time, a wonderful time. But meanwhile, Shador, there have been a lot of hot health topics as per usual. So we'll get into some of those. But first, I want to start off with a comment, a comment that I received on one of one of our YouTube videos. Can you put that comment up, please? All right. It says, uh, this is from Zat. I'll leave it at that. Um, I disagree with what you qualify as hypertension. Typically, if the bottom number is consistently over 90, that constitutes hypertension. On the other hand, if the top number is consistently 130, that does not constitute hypertension. That is within the normal range. All right. So thank you for that comment, Zach. I definitely want to address it because oftentimes there, there is a bit of confusion. First off, when I talk about the definition of hypertension, I'm not just kind of, you know, making a little guess or just kind of saying something on free will. You know, as I've shared, I am board certified in nephrology and hypertension. So the definitions that I share are actually the ones that are accepted by the scientific community. So if you look at JNC, if you the Joint National Commission, if you look at the American Society of Hypertension, American Society of Nephrology, American College of Cardiology, all of the organizations where the scientists make it their life's work to study hypertension have come to a consensus of what hypertension is. Now, that being said, depending on what's going on with you, your physician may tell you a different range that's acceptable depending on what kind of medical conditions you may have. But the definitions that I give for hypertension are not my opinion. This is the accepted consensus. So I will we'll review those. But also, if you check out my YouTube videos, Dr. Dot Frieda, where I'm very proud to say that we have over 704,000 subscribers. I go into 
detail about the definitions. Also on my Instagram page, on my IG, at Dr.Frida. If you go there, follow me there, you'll see where I did a reel, a real easy, quick, one minute reel where I break down the definitions. So according to not my definitions, but the greater accepted definition of hypertension, if your blood pressure is less than 120 for the systolic, the top number, less than 80 for the bottom number, that's considered to be normal blood pressure. If your blood pressure is between 120 and 129 for that top number, then it's considered to be elevated, okay? With that bottom number diastolic still less than 80. Here's the definition of hypertension. If the systolic blood pressure is 130 or greater, or if that diastolic blood pressure is 80 or greater, it is considered to be hypertension. Now, there was a time prior to 2017 where 130 over 80 was not considered hypertension. So this is actually based on new data, new evidence. So between 130 and 139 systolic, that's stage one hypertension, between 80 and 89 diastolic, the bottom number, is also stage one hypertension. If either one of those is in those ranges. And then if that top number is 140 or greater, it's stage two hypertension. If that bottom number is 90 or greater, it's stage two. I go into details on my videos, but just understand when I give the definitions of high blood pressure, I'm not just kind of rolling the dice and then coming up with an opinion. I'm definitely giving you evidence-based information. So while you may disagree with me, this is what the consensus is as far as the definition of hypertension. And I thank you for enjoying my videos. All right. Let's get to some of these topics. First, you know, I want to know, Shador, who was the first person in the chat today? Of course, as always. Our first person in today is Miss Layla Barnes. Hi, Miss Layla Barnes. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you for supporting. As you all come into this chat, please be sure to like the video. It's very important because it lets YouTube know that we're live. It lets them know that we are live and on stage giving evidence-based information. Also, if you have not done so already, please join the party and subscribe. Again, we have over 700,000 YouTube subscribers, and I do give regular health information in my videos. So thank you. And go ahead and share while you're at it. Why not? Share. You know, sharing is caring. All right, let's talk about some of these, these topics in the headlines. Oat Zempic. If you're in the chat, I want you to give me a one if you've heard anything about Oat Zempic. And I believe we have an article on the Oat Zempic, the new TikTok challenge, if you will. So the Oat Zempic, spelled O-A-T, is a challenge saying that if you use oats, lime juice, and water, then it will help you to lose weight, and that is just as good as Ozempic. So I do want to talk about some of the benefits of the oats and of the lime juice and of the water, okay? Because certainly these are our natural substances, so I'm not going to sit here and pretend like they're toxic, but it's not the same as Ozempic. So I also don't want to give any type of a, a misunderstanding for anyone to think that that's actually true. It's not. So in what's being shared with this TikTok challenge, I know one person said that she lost 40 pounds in two months. And she says that it decreases your appetite the same as Ozempic does. And I know this can be attractive to a lot of people because Ozempic is so very expensive. Okay. Not just Ozempic, but also the Manjaro, the Zepbound, the Wegovi, you name it. And a lot of people can't ex afford this, you know, out of their pockets paying $1,500 a month. And many of the insurance companies are not covering the medication if it's solely for weight loss and not for diabetes. So the oat something may sound like, oh gosh, this is it, this is it, but let's talk about it. So first off, the oat zempic, the oats, the lime juice, the water can help you to have a decreased appetite. And this is why oats are filled with fiber. Just one cup of oats has like eight grams of fiber. And so when you eat the oats and you have that, that soluble fiber, it can fill you up, right? And so it can make you feel full for longer. So there's truth in that. And then we know that oats have a lot of good qualities. They can help to decrease bad cholesterol, like the LDL and the triglycerides. And so oats and high fiber, that's good as well. Okay. So it can fill you up. It can help to lower bad cholesterol. And then limes, so those citrus fruits have a lot of good qualities as well. They have vitamin C, which can help with your immune system. It can help to decrease the duration of colds. They also have citrate, which can help with digestion, can help to prevent kidney stones. And of course, water. Being well hydrated is something that can help with your overall health. And if you have a lot of water, then perhaps that can decrease your appetite as well. And so if you are mixing these things together, then perhaps it can slow down your appetite and help you to lose weight. But here's the issue. Here's the issue. 
it is not the same as the Ozempic or the Manjaro or these GLP-1 agonists that have been studied in clinical trials. For these medications, they're not, it's not just a matter of something going in your stomach and filling it up. These GLP-1 agonists like the Ozempic are actually decreasing the motility of your stomach, meaning that instead of you eating food and it moving on and you being hungry in the next four or five hours, it's slowing down how fast your GI tract moves. It's slowing down how fast the food moves from your stomach to the intestines. And so you're full faster. And this is through a biochemical mechanism of the GLP-1 agonist of the drug. And they also work centrally on your brain and it decreases the cravings, not only for foods and like a lot of sweets and starches and unhealthy foods. It can also decrease the cravings for other things that are being studied, potentially even nicotine and alcohol. That's not what it's FDA approved for, but it does decrease cravings. And these, and these things have been studied in large trials. So it's not just a matter of someone, you know, getting some, some oats or oatmeal or, you know, getting some lime juice and, you know, losing a little weight and people sharing their, uh, their stories anecdotally on TikTok. For the Ozempic, we're talking about trials with thousands and thousands of people scientifically at trials that are able to be repeated where the safety has been measured. And so I just don't want anyone to be mistaken to think that Oat Zempic, O-A-T Zempic is the same as Ozempic because it's not. Now, if you consult with your physician or your dietitian, then perhaps, you know, having some oats or some oatmeal in your diet can be good for you. Having lime juice, having water. I'm not saying anything is wrong with that. I just don't want to set up false expectations where you think that having the oats, the lime juice and the water is the same as Ozempic. It's not. All right. Do we have any, any questions on that or any comments? Um, not necessarily comments regarding the oat milk itself. Um, we do have a comment from... Um, what did I do with it? Oh, Miss Chatting with Al. Uh, well, Chatting with Al, I'm sorry. Hi, Chatting with Al. Uh, what happened to the old-fashioned way? Just eat whole foods and fruits. Well, like, you know, you know, a lot of people will say that. They'll be like, oh, just, you know, eat less, move more. Eat less, move more. And here's the thing with obesity and living with obesity, the obesity that we're learning. It is not as simple as that. You have different people with different metabolisms. And we're learning that there are people who are genetically predisposed to living with obesity. Haven't you ever looked at like a kindergarten class or even looked at, at young kids in the family and you see how most of the kids running around are pretty skinny, right? Pretty slim. But you have some kids who just are very overweight. And even if the other kids eat as much as the kid who is living with being overweight or obese, the other kids just won't really gain the weight the same. And this is largely, yes, it can be lifestyle. Like, you know, maybe they're eating a lot of fast food at home or a lot of foods with, with, foods with added sugar. But we know that there are also many hormonal reasons and genetic reasons. In other words, there are some people who are living with obesity who have literally tried to just move more and eat less. And I've seen them in my office. People where even when you do a food diary, sometimes they still have high weight. And there are other things too. It could be because of high thyroid, but it could, could be because of a leptin gene, or it could be because of something going on in the hypothalamus. My point is, now that we know and have done the research to know that living with obesity can be a disease, just like being addicted to food can be, yes, a disease, something with the reward pathway where you just kind of have to have that reward, that dopamine release, then we need other options other than just eat less, move more, which is why we have different drugs, like not just the Ozempic or the Wegovy or the Manjaro or the Zetbound, but others as well. That being said, we still do want people to have proper diets you know, mostly plant-based, yes, works, lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, drinking all of your water, moving your body. According to the American Heart Association, you should be moving your body or exercising at least 150 minutes per week, just about 30 minutes, five times a day. And that's the other thing. Taking Ozempic does not cancel a good lifestyle, okay? If you take the Ozempic and then you're just like, okay, I'm done, mm -mm, it's not going to work for you. You're going to lose muscle mass and you very well won't lose weight. You might lose a lot of weight initially, but for the long term, you have to have the healthy lifestyle. So it's not either or, it's both, okay? Any other comments? Thank you for that. Yeah, I get that a lot. I just, yeah. you know, eat less. Yeah. Yeah, we do get that a lot. Miss mm -hmm. uh, Aurelia? Hi, Miss Aurelia. I was also diabetic. She mentioned before that she was um, hypertensive in 2019, but was out of, uh, she took a uh, berber bean with cholesterol and red yeast rice, so... Uh, mm -hmm. She's got her blood pressure under control, but she says, I was also diabetic and I took cinnamon and chromion instead of taking mm -hmm. metformin and taking insulin. My blood sugar is below 100 every time I check it. 
Wonderful, wonderful. So you brought up something that's really interesting, the berberine. That's one of those supplements. And for a while that was on social media with the craze saying that berberine was the new Ozempic. And with this supplement, now there have been studies and there is truth to the matter that it can help to decrease the appetite. It can help you to lose weight, the berberine. Does it have as strong effects as, as Ozempic? No studies have shown it. But under the supervision of a physician, then many, many doctors do actually have patients to take the berberine as a weight loss supplement. And the cinnamon definitely has holistic benefits for lowering your blood pressure. And yeah, so definitely the cinnamon. Make sure if you haven't already, check out my YouTube video on this channel, Dr. Dot Frida, on how to lower blood pressure naturally and the best foods to eat for lowering blood pressure. And I mentioned cinnamon, so that's good as well. So congratulations on that blood sugar being low. And the other piece is when you have a healthy body weight, with a low amount of fat, specifically a low amount of belly fat, abdominal fat, visceral fat, that helps to increase your body's sensitivity to insulin, and that helps with diabetes as well. So there's definitely more than one way to skin a cat, and so thank you for sharing. All right, so now that we've talked about oat zempic, I want to talk about the real Ozempic Shador because we have the comedian and the actor Tracy Morgan who was doing an interview and you know folks were like oh my gosh you look really good or what are you doing you've been hitting the gym and he's like yeah I've been hitting the gym but I've been hitting the Ozempic he says that he's been taking Ozempic which has helped him to to really lose weight to be able to maintain a healthy weight and I love that he's sharing it because he is someone who was li is living with diabetes. I don't know if his is, is diet controlled now or if he needed the Ozempic prior, but diabetes, which led to him having kidney failure. And he's actually a kidney transplant recipient, with a which a lot of people don't know. And so we have that article here. Hmm. Ooh, let me stay hydrated. Y'all, hydration is important. Check out my, my YouTube video on, on how drinking water is important for healthy kidneys. It is, and a lot of other things. But yeah, so Tracy Morgan. Now y'all know that man is is too much and too funny. He's he's really quite bananas, and so he's laughing and losing. But he's talking about something very serious, the Ozempic. Now, in his case, in his case, if he still had high blood sugars where he was meeting diabetes level, then he would have already qualified per FDA for the Ozempic, even without the weight loss component. Okay, so he does have that, but. If he was living with, had he been living with obesity, meaning having a BMI of greater than 30, of 30 or greater. Now remember, BMI, that body mass index, is not the best measure of weight because it doesn't take into account your bone density or your muscle mass, but it's what the FDA uses for us to approve medicines. So you are eligible for Ozempic for weight loss, or really Wegovy is the semaglutide that's approved. And let me just back up a little bit. The maglutide is the generic name for both Ozempic and Wegovy. They are the same drug, semaglutide. They are GLP-1 agonists. So in order to use it for weight loss, the Wegovy is what's specifically FDA approved for weight loss. So if your BMI is 30 or greater, or if your BMI is 27 or greater, and you have at least one other disease or comorbidity, like high blood pressure, kidney disease, cholesterol, then it's FDA approved for you to be on the Ozempic. And again, it works by making you feel fuller for longer, decreasing cravings. Now we talk about weight loss so much, but for the diabetics, which again, Tracy Morgan is a diabetic, or at least at one point was diabetic, whether he's diet controlled now or not. It also was originally for di diabetes mellitus type two, because these GLP-1 agonists, the semaglutide, like the Ozempic and the Wegovy, also stimulate your pancreas to increase insulin production if you need it. So that's how it helps with the diabetes, right? So you're increasing the insulin production. Plus, as you lose weight and you lose some of that belly fat, belly, belly, the visceral uh, adipose tissue, once you lose some of that, then you're more sensitive to the insulin you're producing. So that's the story on that. But for him, he says that's helping him to maintain a healthy weight. And he's joking about it. But quite frankly, as you lose the weight, it does help to improve your health. Now, many people are annoyed because they say, oh, people are just using these drugs for vanity. And now all the diabetics are running out of them. And, you're, and it's true. There are people who are just using the drugs for vanity, which is why Eli Lilly, the maker of Mount Jaro and Zepbound, really went off during the Academy Awards, as we talked about here before. They went off saying that the drugs are not for the people at the Oscars who just want to be vain. In other words, if you're already pretty slim, if you're a size six, female and you want to get down to a size two or a zero, but really you weren't unhealthy and you weren't living with obesity, 
that's not the point of the drugs. But for people who really are living with obesity, then not only do these drugs help you to lose weight, not only do they help to decrease your chances of having diabetes or correct your diabetes or prediabetes if you have it, we have other studies as well. One study has shown that the Wegovy, the semaglutide, has actually helped to decrease cardiovascular risks. Yes, to decrease heart disease, so much so that the FDA has allowed them to put it on the label, okay, that Wegovy can decrease your heart disease risks, okay? And we know that heart disease is the number one killer, okay? It's the number one cause of death for people in the United States. So that's a big deal. We're not just talking about vanity anymore. And then there's another trial that was done called the FLOW trial to see if the Ozempic, the semaglutide, actually helped to decrease kidney disease, chronic kidney disease. And guess what? The results were so overwhelming that they stopped the trial a year early because there have been signs that it can actually help to decrease kidney disease. And we know that if you have a healthier weight, that can help with your joints, your arthritis. It can help to, so now we're knowing it can help decrease kidney disease, of course, help to decrease the diabetes, help decrease your risk for heart disease, strokes. So there's so much more to it. And so if you have someone who's living with obesity, you know, instead of just kind of telling them, oh, well, you know, you try another diet, try another diet, try another diet. Now that we have these tools, you know, such as the GLP-1 agonist, then as long as it's being done under the supervision of a physician, hey, I don't see a problem with it. And I do prescribe them as well. Not for the folks trying to get from a size two to a size zero, not for the men trying to get from, you know, 195 pounds and they're, you know, six foot two and they want to get down to 175 pounds. No, not for the vanity, but for the health. Do we have any comments or any questions? Uh, no, nothing regarding the, the Olympic. All right. All right. So now I want to talk about Halle Berry. Halle Berry, Halle Berry. Make sure that you are liking this video as you come in, as we're sharing this evidence-based medicine. And make sure you subscribe to my channel as well. And, you know, and I'll have in the description, I have a freebie for you. I do. I do. A lot of us, you know, we're moving on. We're, we're stepping into spring. And we're still, you know, some of us have had our, our New Year's resolutions and we've been sticking with those pretty well. But other ones, you know, it's just human. You kind of go in and out and, and just you have that goal of being healthy. Well, here I have a free PDF you can download on 10 healthy habits for a better life and a better you. And these are just some of the habits I use as I try to live my healthiest and happiest life. This information is evergreen and it really can help you if you use this as a checklist from day to day. So make sure you click the link in the description and you'll be able to download these 10 healthy habits for a better you and a better life. All right. Now I want to talk about this next story, which I found to be quite shocking, quite shocking, frankly. Um, and what we'll do is I'll go into the story. And as we, and for people who actually have questions, you can kind of earmark those. Then we'll get into some, some questions, you know, toward the end. But, 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 Halle Berry. Halle Berry, Halle Berry. Y'all know that song. Am I just aging myself? Y'all know about that Halle Berry song. But of course we know we have the Academy Award winning actress Halle Berry. We have watched her over the years, over the decades in Monsters Ball, but also in so many other roles, including uh, the different uh, movies where she's been the Marvel hero, as well as, what was that, Finding Isaiah. We've seen her with great range. We've seen her in Baps, which was kind of a trip. That's kind of a little different kind of a movie. But we all know and love Halle Berry. She shared some of the things she's gone through over the years, including being a diabetic. You know, from a young age, she was diabetic, which a lot of times we hear so much about people with diabetes mellitus type 2. A lot of them are living with obesity, which puts them at risk. But of course, Halle Berry has been thin, thin you know, for as long as she's been alive, as far as I know, as, as far as we've ever seen. And this has just been kind of one of the, the cards that she was dealt. So these are some of the health issues that Halle Berry had. But in an interview with our first lady, Dr. Jill Biden, Halle Berry shared how she went to see her physician because she was having very painful intercourse, okay? She said that it felt like razors in her female private reproductive organ when she was having intercourse with her boyfriend. She said it felt like razors. So she went to her doctor to be to find out what was going on, and her doctors told her that it was the worst case of herpes he had ever seen. Have mercy. Can you imagine that you're fully grown, 57 years old, I believe, and you're in a committed monogamous relationship 
happy as she's ever been, she shares. And now she's having the pain during intercourse. And her doctor told her that she had the worst case of herpes. So she said she told the doctor, I don't have any herpes. But then she went back to her boyfriend. And you know, she cussed him out, y'all. She didn't say that, but she went off on him and was like, you gave me herpes. And so he's like, ah, you know, he's caught off guard, says he didn't. So they both went and got tested. And as it turns out, Neither one has herpes. Halle Berry doesn't have herpes. Her boyfriend doesn't have herpes. But you know what the misdiagnosis was? What she really actually has? Perimenopause. Now, how do you like that? Them apples. You know, I know that we have a lot of ladies who listen and who follow Shador. And nobody wants to think about perimenopause causing it to feel like razors if you're being intimate with your loved one. But these are Halle Berry's symptoms. And she told uh, First Lady Biden that she did not feel ashamed as she shouldn't and talking about it because she was thinking that in her voicing what she went through, perhaps she could help other women. And I agree, she can. So let's just talk about um, a few things. First, I want y'all to give me a two in the chat if y'all heard that story. Put a two in the chat if you heard that or saw that headline in the news about Halle Berry's misdiagnosis. All right, and then should all ask if anyone actually heard about it. So first, let's talk, we'll talk about herpes and what that is, and then we'll actually talk about perimenopause and who goes through it, what is it, what are the definitions, and most importantly, what you can do about it. So herpes, you know, back when I did my uh, residency at Georgetown University Hospital, and I did my infectious disease rotation. So when I did my residency at Georgetown, you know, I, I did a double one in internal medicine and in pediatrics. And of course, we did all the rotations, adult and pediatric. And one of the rotations I did was an infectious disease, right? Learning about the different infections. And one of my favorite infectious disease professors got up once and she did our grand rounds, like our big lecture for all of the attending, the senior physicians, the residents, the medical students. And she opened up the lecture by saying, what is the difference between true love and herpes? Herpes lasts a lifetime. I was like, oh my gosh. So she always was, you know, was kind of a lot when she started her lectures. But the truth is that herpes is an STI, sexually transmitted infection. And even though we have some treatments to help to decrease the symptoms, it actually does last a lifetime. There's no cure that will eradicate herpes, okay? It is a lifetime commitment. Now, whether or not true love is, y'all can talk to my infectious disease professor about that, but herpes is a lifetime commitment. Fortunately, now we do have a lot of medications to make it better. So herpes, there, there are a couple of different types of herpes, herpes simplex virus, HSV1 and HSV2. If ever you've had like cold sores, like little sores in the mouth, corn in the mouth and the tongue, that's typically the non-sexually transmitted kind. And that's uh, like, you know, from, from viruses that can pass on the mouth, they often flare when your immune system is compromised and they call them cold sores sometimes. That is different from the sexually transmitted infection or the genital herpes. The genital herpes are typically caused by HSV2, herpes simplex 2. And it happens after sexual contact, okay? And anyone who tells you, oh, I think I picked up herpes from the commode or I picked it up from a chair or I picked it up from a towel, not likely because it's a virus that's very unstable unless it is on the human body in a warm, moist situation. So it's difficult to pass herpes from one person to the next unless there's some type of a sexual intercourse going on, be it oral, vaginal, anal, you name it. Okay, this is a daytime show. Nope, it's nighttime. At any rate, so when people have sexual contact and they come into contact with someone else who has herpes, then the symptoms will pre present as oftentimes a burning, fiery, situation in your genitals. So for women, it could be really, really red, inflamed, swollen, painful, burning labia or in the vagina. For men, the same thing on the penis. And you can get these tiny little sores. It can start off as like little red dots. And then it, the little dots can raise, a macular papillary rash, little red dots, and then they raise. And then it turns into little blisters, right? Vesicles or blisters. And it can take like three weeks for them to go away on their own. You know, different people present in different ways. But when people have the primary infection, the first time they get it, they can sometimes get sick throughout and have fevers or have symptoms of urinary tract infections or bladder infection where they're using the restroom frequently. And if you have herpes, it can feel like razors when you're having intercourse. And these are the symptoms that Halle Berry shared that she had. So the thing about the herpes, the, the virus, once it gets 
you know, you get it on your, your, your skin, on your genitals, the virus actually travels to your central nervous system where it hangs out and it becomes dormant. It just kind of hangs out and sleeps there until it's reactivated, okay? And then it can travel, travel, travel down the nervous system and it can show up again so you can get flares. So again, there's no total cure to get rid of it. Even I see a lot of people on social media, Shador, talking about, oh, this saved my life. I've been totally cured, cured from herpes. I have people who will come and troll my sites with that. No, but there are certain medications, certain antivirals like acyclovir or valacyclovir. So make sure you consult with your physician. Don't do any of the home remedies or the social media remedies unless you consult with your physician. And the medications are so good now that you really can lead a very healthy, very happy life even if you do have herpes. I know it has a huge stigma, you know, and people like to talk about it like it's the new scarlet letter. But the truth of the matter is a lot of people have been exposed. A lot of people have been exposed. And, you know, this is, we live in a life where, you know, you can have high risk behavior or you can be monogamous with someone. And if uh, you can be monogamous with your husband or your wife, but if they're out there and they get herpes, you might get it too. I say that to say, I don't want us to be judgmental about it. But as it turns out, that's not, what Halle Berry had. Um, did anyone in the chat say they had already heard the story before Shador? Anybody put a two up if they had already heard the Halle Berry story? Yeah, we had a, a few people put a two up and also made a comment in terms of it. So Val Self have heard of it. Um, okay. Miss, Delic Miss Delicious has heard of it. Uh, Miss Delicious um, said, it sounds like Holly's doctor needs some refresher trainers. Training classes. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? What a shady person said that? Miss Delicious. <laughs> it's true. If you're going to tell somebody something like that, you don't know if you're going to cause them to have a psychological break. Like she could have gone home and really gone off on her boyfriend, right? She could have just walked through the door doing something crazy or start throwing shoes or throwing bows. And so it is, you know, very important that if, if you think someone has a diagnosis, he says the worst case of herpes, herpes he's ever seen, he or she, I don't know what the doctor was, but um, I agree. There's a, there's a refresher course, even in bedside manner, say it's a possibility, but let me test first. You know, don't say, oh yeah, you got it. Your boyfriend gave it to you. Bye. You know, right. yeah, you get yeah. apple, apple a day. <laughs> Who else said something? They heard about uh, it. Miss Layla, she's heard of it. She's the first person here today uh, once again. Yay. Uh, she right. says, you, you know our health. It's so important to get a misdiagnosis. This is just devastating. It makes you question, make you trust your doctors. That's true. Because you, you really should be able to trust your doctors. That's why it's so important for us as physicians is to have a certain amount of humility, right? When we say things, it's not always in absolutes, right? But when you're giving something that can really be life-changing, like the diagnosis of herpes, you better be just about sure or before you say anything, say there's a few things it could be, let me test you. And, you know, you got to handle that more gently. But I do appreciate Halle Berry for, for sharing. I think she has a pretty kind of a, a good sense of humor about herself to be able to share it, not worry about it, not worry about the stigma. And I think that she is going to help some people because there's some people who are going to hear me and hear these symptoms I'm describing. Because if you've ever had these symptoms, but now you don't, that doesn't mean that it went away. It could be dormant. And so it's important to go. You can get tested. If you have active lesions, then your doctor can actually take a swab where they remove the top of the blister and, and sample what's inside of it. Or they also have um, cer certain tests like HSV, PCR, polymerase chain reaction, different tests they can do, but consult with your physician. But yeah, herpes is real. It's out here along the, uh, with other sexually transmitted infections. Another big one that's on the rise, not to be confused with what Halle Berry was misdiagnosed with, is syphilis. Okay. And if you go to my Instagram at dr.frida, you'll get a chance to see where I was on a television station, this was 11 Alive News, where I was talking about how syphilis is actually on the rise. Yes, syphilis is a sexually transmitted infection that we thought that we had just about eradicated, like in the 1990s. But now, according to the CDC, we have higher levels than we've had since the 1950s. OK, syphilis is all the way up, all the way up. No one can stop me. It's all the way up. And there are lots of different reasons, Shador. Some is because we don't have as much of the the sexual sex education we used to have, a lot of funding has been lost for that. And then there's congenital syphilis, which is when a mother is pregnant and has syphilis, she can pass it on to her child and that can cause devastating complications. And so if mothers don't have prenatal care, because in the prenatal care, it's pretty routine to check for syphilis. They do an RPR as a screening test. And, but if you don't have prenatal care, you don't know if you have syphilis, you can have it, your child can have it. And it also, it, it's common 
commonly um, passed on at the same time that people get HIV. So people who are at high risk for HIV are often at high risk for getting syphilis. The good news, the good news about syphilis is that it's actually not a very smart bacterium because penicillin still kills syphilis, okay? So being treated with penicillin, you can get rid of syphilis and there is a treatment for syphilis, especially if you catch it in the early stages, the primary and secondary stages. And just real quickly, the symptom that most people will get with syphilis is that they'll get a sore, like a shanker, a painless shanker on the genitals. So it'll be like a little ulcer with like kind of some raised, the raised edges might look almost like a little donut, but it's not going to be painful. And so you might look at it, you might go, oh, that's kind of odd but it doesn't hurt you. You may not want to talk about it. You may not want to see your doctor and it will go away. The problem is that once it goes away, the syphilis is still in your body. And then it can come back as secondary syphilis where you can get a rash on your palms, on the soles of your feet, a rash throughout your body. And that secondary syphilis, if you ignore that, this, it will go away, but then it'll come back. Years later, you can have uh, latent syphilis, neurosyphilis, where you end up having um, dementia. You can have heart disease, disease of the aorta. It can kill you, basically. And so make sure the moral of the story is you pay attention to your body, okay? Pay attention to your body. All right. So that's it on the, the sexually transmitted infections. But I do want to talk about the perimenopause. And make sure everyone, thank you for joining. Make sure you like this video as you come in. It lets YouTube know that we're here, that Shador and I are doing these lives now. And it really helps our channel. And we thank you kindly. So like the video as you come in, make sure you share and make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you'll know when we are doing videos. Do we have any questions before I go on to talk about perimenopause? Yes, I did have one question from one moment. Miss Renita. Hi, Miss Renita. She says my daughter tested positive for HSV1, but not two. Does that mm -hmm. mean she's not she just had cold sores in the past, but not the STI? Yes. So HSV1 is typically not the sexually transmitted infection. That's typically with the cold sores that you might get in your mouth. Yes. And it's very common, the HSV1. Okay, little ulcerations in the mouth. Yeah. Now, HSV2 can show up in the mouth if that's the sexual contact, but yeah. All right. Any other questions coming in related? Uh, yes, I asked you one. Just popped in from Patrick. Hi, Patrick. And Dr. Frida, I was sexually assaulted in 09. Should I have my doctor test me for everything? I'm so sorry that happened to you. And the answer is yes. Yes. Even though it's been all these years later, please have the doctor to test you. And you can go ahead and specifically ask, test me for syphilis, test me for herpes, HSV, definitely test me for HIV, okay? Gonorrhea, syphilis, trichomonas, HPV, okay? We have tests for HPV, human papillomavirus. Have them to test you for everything because the good thing is even certain things that are latent or that you may have had, and I pray you don't have any of it. We do have different treatments and managements. Again, I'm really sorry that happened to you, but yes, please go in and get tested for everything. Consult with your doctor. All right. And speaking of, you mentioned HPV, Ms. Val. Um, mm -hmm. That's hello. Is HPV curable? I, HPV, is it curable? So once you have HPV and it's in your system, um, it is treatable, I should say. It should, it's treatable. But oftentimes, like if you've already been exposed to HPV and you have genital warts, those warts can be removed, but it's always possible for them to come back. If you have HPV and it's affecting the female organ, the cervix, then it might cause you to have an abnormal pap smear, for example. Now, having an abnorm abnormal pap smear is treatable potentially. So as long as the abnormal pap smear is not cancer, maybe some cells, then there can be the removal of those cells, which will decrease your risk for cervical cancer. The HPV is still in your body though. And so it's not completely curable as far as going away, but treatable. And same thing with, if you have HPV that has affected the anus, you know, and even if, if you've had uh, anyone who's had a history of, of anal intercourse or even not, sometimes the fluids will just go and it'll be in the anus and it can cause anal cancer, rectal cancer, the HPV can. And so again, we have anal pap smears. We can find out if you are positive and there's certain treatments to do. The best way to 
treat, or I'm sorry, to prevent HPV is to get the HPV vaccine. Make sure you consult with your doctor. What I'm giving on this channel is information. It does not replace your medical advice. It's not medical advice. It's information. So make sure you consult with your doctors. But for the HPV vaccine, which was introduced in 2006, it's actually being recommended for kids as young as nine, like between nine and 11. Why? Because HPV is the most common sexually transmitted infection. We don't really think of it as an STI because so many people have it and, and they usually don't have symptoms. It's not one of the, the drippy, gooey, itchy, scratchy, rashy infections. It's not. A lot of people have it. And so, again, if you find out that you've had HPV, now I'm not talking to you specifically, I'm saying general you. If a person finds out that they have HPV, don't go home and curse out your partner and be like, you gave me HPV, because chances are, if your partner is the one who has HPV, you could have had it first. Your partner probably didn't know. It's just really a silent, silent situation. But the best thing is to get an HPV vaccine. Again, starting with kids nine to 11 years old, full disclosure, all three of my kids have been vaccinated against HPV, which means that their chances of getting cervical cancer down the line or getting anal cancer down the line are very, very low. By far, HPV is the most common cause of cervical cancer. And we talked last week about the very beautiful influencer, or the beauty influencer, Jessica Petway, who died at the age of 36 from cervical cancer. And I have countless patients, young patients who died from cervical cancer. The HPV vaccine is the best way to prevent that. HPV, HPV can cause other cancers as well, not just cervical cancer, not just anal cancer. It can cause penis cancer, penile cancer. It can cause throat cancer. OK, the actor Michael Douglas had throat cancer. OK, likely from HPV. I believe he actually shared that that was what it was from. And then who? Martina Navratilova, the tennis great, also throat cancer. OK, if you if that is your sexual contact and you, you get you can get it orally from your partner, the HPV, and it can cause throat cancer. OK, that's just a real deal. So talk to your doctors about HPV vaccine, even though it's introduced in kids and they at first said that you could get it up to the age 20s. Now you can get it up to age 40s and beyond. But have that individual conversation with your doctor. That's a really good question about the HPV. All right. Again, this is Medicine in the News. I'm Dr. Frieda. We're talking about our Medical Monday with hot health topics in the news. And we're here every Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time talking about medicine in the news. Make sure Dr. you put Frida, your question. Monday. Today is Monday. Today is Monday. What I say? <laughs> April Fools, right? Today's Monday. Yeah, it's April. Monday. <laughs> what I say? You say every Friday. Oh, child, it's every Monday. I guess I am April fooling myself. Lord help us. <laughs> yes, every Monday, Medical Mondays, Medical Mondays at six p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So, so back to Halle Berry. So yes, her doctor misdiagnosed her and said that she had herpes, when really she had perimenopause. Let's talk about what perimenopause is. Sounds like a total nightmare, but a nightmare that most women will eventually go through. Now, here's the thing. Menopause is actually not a disease. It's not a disorder. It's just a normal transition of life. Doesn't it seem like women get the short end of the stick on a lot of things? I mean, first of all, you have to have the <sighs> menstrual cycles. You, you're the ones who give birth to children. Love my children. You know, childbirth is not necessarily easy. Anyway, I won't talk about uh, life for, of women, but menopause. Okay. So by definition, menopause is when a woman or someone born a woman has gone 12 months without having a menstrual cycle, 12 months without having a menstrual cycle. So that is the definition of menopause. But perimenopause is that time when you're transitioning into that period, OK, where you may get abnormal menstrual cycle. You may develop vasomotor abnormalities or hot flashes, sleep disturbances, even joint problems, depression, irritability, anxiety, weight gain. All of this transitioning to the time of you actually having menopause is called perimenopause. And that's what it actually turns out that Halle Berry has. And, you know, between the ages of 40 and 48 is when most women will get start experiencing perimenopause. Some studies say between 45 and 55. It can happen as young as the 30s. And there is something called premature ovarian failure where the ovaries can stop producing normal amounts of estrogen much earlier than that. But for most women, we're talking about 40s to 50s, 45 to 55, 40 to 48, where they're experiencing the perimenopause. And it can take seven years to transition into menopause, seven years of all of these symptoms of being irritable and so forth and so on. And for some people, it can take 14 years, please. Oh my gosh, I don't want that. 14 years of perimenopause. 
But here's the thing, going back to Halle Berry specifically, another one of the symptoms of perimenopause is vaginal dryness. It can be vaginal dryness. And for women who get this vaginal dryness and get very thin walls, thin dry walls of their vaginas, then having the intercourse could potentially feel like you've got razor blades in your vagina, which is what Halle Berry described. That's a pretty graphic description, but hey, that's what it is. And that sounds like misery. And like, you might just want to go sit down somewhere and just hang it up. But the good thing is that there are treatments, okay? So make sure that you talk to your physician. And one of the really important things about doing conversations like this, Shador, is so that, because if people haven't heard about it, they don't know what to, to do or know what to ask when they go see their doctors. So in case you go to your doctor and you say it feels like a razor blades, and your doctor says, oh, it's the worst case of herpes I've ever seen. You can say, uh, might it be perimenopause? Okay, you want to have your own education and be able to advocate for yourself. So there are ways to to diagnose beyond just clinical symptoms, ways to diagnose, you know, someone who likely has perimenopause. One, you can ask for certain blood tests, FSH, as in follicle stimulating hormone, and they can also test your estrogen levels. For someone who is going through menopause or even perimenopause, the FSH levels will be high. And yeah, they do have some home FSH kits, Shador, but because the FSH actually fluctuates from day to day, it's really of best interest to go to a physician who fully understands how to interpret the FSH levels. But that's one way to see if you have the perimenopause. And then there are treatments. The treatments can range from nothing, you know, if you're someone who doesn't have bad symptoms or if you're doing okay, but then there's also estrogen replacement. And if you still have a uterus, you have it's important that you have estrogen and progestin because the hormone replacement therapy for some people, it can increase their risks for certain cancers. And so again, it's very important to have this discussion with your physician on whether the estrogen is appropriate for you. There's also certain antidepressants like the SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that can help with some of the symptoms like the hot flashes. And then even things like gabapentin. Shador, you know, we prescribe gabapentin or we have patients on gabapentin. Typically that helps with neuropathy or like the tingly nerves of the fingers, the tingly nerves of the toes that people might get from diabetes or other nerve pains. But in some cases, Gabapentin has been shown to help decrease hot flashes that some women may get when they're going through perimenopause. And then even, this is interesting, Shador, even some blood pressure medicines. Now, you know I've used clonidine. Don't love clonidine as a long-term blood pressure medicine, but it's really effective in getting blood pressures down quickly. You witnessed us giving someone clonidine and decreasing the blood pressure. But clonidine, in some cases, can also help with hot flash symptoms, if you can believe that. So there's different things like that. And then some patients actually... Yes, women, people born as women, people who identify as women who are going to stay women can get testosterone treatments as well. Talk to your physician, talk to your primary care doctor, like your internist, your family doctor. You can also talk to your OBGYN, of course. And then some urologists are giving the testosterone to women to help. Okay, Halle Berry. Her symptoms of it feeling like she had razor blades in her vagina when she had intercourse with her boyfriend, a lot of people for that will get topical estrogen, meaning like an estrogen cream or an estrogen gel that you literally put in on around your vagina. And that can help with lubrication. It can also help with really thin vaginas that can happen in perimenopause to help that, that tissue to be a little thicker. And then there's some people who do laser therapy, some urologists, some gynecologists. The point is I'm providing you with some information but you must consult with your physician. If you have perimenopause, it's not the end of the road. And that's what Halle Berry was saying, that she's not going to sit back and act like allow society to tell her that it's over, have a seat, you don't count. She's like, she's not doing that. you know. So she's going to face this perimenopause head on and she wants other women to do it as well. And so I find that to be quite admirable. But that's the Halle Berry story. They misdiagnosed Halle Berry with the worst case of herpes they'd ever seen when truth be told, she had perimenopause, which is what over a billion women worldwide are living with from day to day. All right. Any comments or questions relating to perimenopause that you see? No, ma'am. Not this All right. comment. All right. Good deal. Yeah. It's so funny. Some people refer to perimenopause as, as personal summers where they just get hot, 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 or they have really awful sleep where they wake up just drenched, drenched mm -hmm. in sweat. All right. So for our last topic, I want to talk about alcohol and how some studies show that alcohol use can increase your risk for cancer. And I think we have an article on that. 
And, you know, Shador, we've known for a long time that alcohol, though it's legal, can really be quite harmful. You know, it can, can cause a lot of issues. And I actually have one YouTube, YouTube video on this Dr. Frida channel where I talk about alcohol and the dangers of alcohol. And one of them is that it can increase your risk for certain cancers. It can increase risk for breast cancer as well, which is what this article talks about. And a lot of women don't know that because it's just like, what's alcohol have to do with your breast? Well, it can certainly cause an increased chance of mutating the DNA to cause you to have breast cancer. Okay. Does that mean that everyone who is drinking or having a couple of glasses of wine is going to get breast cancer? No, but there've been enough studies to show us at this point that it's more than a coincidence. And women who do drink alcohol, sometimes even just moderate alcohol will have an increased risk or can possibly have an increased risk of developing breast cancer than, than other women who don't drink. You can also have an increased risk of developing liver cancer. Okay. With alcohol use. And before I go any further, let's just talk about alcohol use and what it is. So here's the thing. According to the CDC, alcohol use is the number one cause of preventable death in the United States. The number one cause of preventable death. And most people who die from alcohol, well, 40% of the people who die from alcohol participate in binge drinking, which by definition, by CDC definition, binge drinking is having four or more drinks in one setting if you're a woman or having five or more drinks in one setting, if you're a man. And then there's some other definitions like what is excessive alcohol use. And again, I can't in good faith tell you that any amount of alcohol is good, but according to definitions that have been kind of laid out by the CDC, there is a definition of excessive alcohol use. So for women, if you have eight drinks or more per week, it's considered to be excessive alcohol use. For men, 15 drinks or more per week is considered to be excessive alcohol use. Now, that gender discrepancy is really a trip because, I mean, think, you know a lot of women who might have more muscle mass, more fat, be taller than men. Does the same hold true for them? I don't know. But these are the black and white definitions, and I do know those leave some room for questions, okay? But the definition of a drink. What's the definition of a drink? I know a lot of folks say, oh, yeah, I just had a drink. And I'm like, oh, what's your definition of a drink? What'd you have? And they might have like a 20 ounce of dark liquor. That is not a drink. OK, that's a lot of drinks. So by definition, a drink is five ounces of wine. OK, or 12 ounces of beer. Or if you're drinking something that's a, like an 80 proof liquor, something a little stronger, then we're talking 1.5 ounces. And if you think about it, like if you're out to dinner with friends or if a, a bartender is serving up, a lot of times they're pouring more than 1.5 ounces. So you might be having multiple drinks and what you think is one drink. And so having excessive amounts of alcohol can increase your risk for cancer. And even again, moderate drink, even if you're drinking in some studies, they show just a drink a day that could increase your risk compared to someone who drinks no alcohol. So these are just some things for you to have as food for thought talk to your physician about it, talk to yourself about it on, you know, just how important is alcohol to you, knowing that now we do have definitive studies showing that it can increase your risk for cancer. And there's some other, some other dangers of alcohol as well that we know about. We know that alcohol can um, increase your risk for hepatitis, okay? It can increase your risk for heart disease, yes, if you have um, excessive alcohol use, or even in some cases, moderate alcohol use, it can increase your risk for a dilated cardiomyopathy where the heart is stretched out and then you can get abnormal heart rhythms, okay, arrhythmias. Alcohol can put you at risk for that. Alcohol can increase your risk for high blood pressure, for hypertension. Alcohol can also impair brain function. We already know that it's considered to be a central nervous system depressant, okay? kind of bring you down, whatever. Um, it can also cause a euphoria, right? Where it has you kind of hype. It can affect your impulse control, have you making some decisions that aren't wise, especially if you hop yourself behind the wheel of a car after you've had alcohol. Ooh, that takes me to Real Housewives of Potomac, R-H-O-P. Karen, I'm sorry, she's still one of my favorites, but she recently had a, a DUI driving under the influence. And apparently, you know, if you go and you look it up, it looks like she is really blessed to even be alive. But let me just give a quick PSA, a quick public service announcement. We have so many Ubers, Lyfts, ride shares, so many options. So if you do decide to drink, okay, even if it wasn't your plan to drink or to get to the point where you're intoxicated, inebriated, if you've been drinking, 
please do not drive, not only to save your own life, but how unfortunate is it when people who've been drinking kill others, kill themselves? And in this day and age, there are too many options. So please don't drive drunk. Okay, that's my PSA for that. All right, so back to the alcohol. Um, here's another thing that alcohol can affect. It can affect your sex life. I'm talking about sex a lot today. I don't know what that is. Anyway, it can affect the sex life. So when someone drinks alcohol, it can really make them aroused and interested in sex. But guess what? For men, it can make you not have the ability to perform. Okay. You can have a little temporary erectile dysfunction when you are intoxicated. So think about that when you're somewhere trying to, to drink, 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 and go do whatever you want to do. It can affect your, your sexual function. Make sure you check out my video, The Dangers, The Dark Side of Alcohol, where I talk about that. But yes, studies are showing us that alcohol can increase the risk for cancers, including breast cancer. Consult with your doctor. And, and if you feel, I'll put a link in the description. If you feel like you have an issue with alcohol, you know, there's, of course, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, and there are other means of seeking help as well. I'll make sure we have a link in the description. And there are some celebrities who've now shared that they've stopped drinking alcohol, okay? One is Anne Hathaway. Do y'all like that movie, Devil Wears Prada? Ooh, give me a three in the chat if you've seen the movie, Devil Wears Prada. That's one of my favorite movies. I'll tell you that right now. With Mel Street. Anyway, Anne Hathaway is, you know, she's the protagonist, the, the main person in that movie. She's been in other stuff too, Princess Diaries. Oh, she was in Brokeback Mountain too. And I like Anne Hathaway because I find that she tends to be pretty honest in her interviews. She said that when she was in Hollywood, she was told that there was nothing sexy about her and she could never be a sex symbol. Can you imagine? But then she told them that she was a Scorpio and she said that she never let that get her down. But anyway, all right, Devil Wears Prada. That's where I really love Anne Hathaway from. But Anne Hathaway has stopped drinking. She said she completely gave up alcohol, personal choice. She said um, that she feels better without it. She's a mother. She and her husband are the parents of two young sons. And she said she just feels like she thinks clear. And at first she'd be embarrassed, you know, because alcohol is everywhere. You go to a wedding, there's alcohol. You go to, look, now you go to baby showers, there's alcohol. You are looking at internet, you're looking at Zoom shows, like, oh, what y'all drinking tonight? There's alcohol everywhere. It's just so accepted in society. And so she actually felt a little embarrassed when she decided to stop drinking, but she made that personal choice and now she's come out and shared it, which I, I think that's admirable. And she also says she doesn't judge people who do drink, but she decided it's not right for her. Do y'all know who else stopped drinking? Tiffany Haddish. Y'all know Tiffany Haddish, girls trip Tiffany Haddish, comedian Tiffany Haddish, where, you know, she's had some trouble and in, in, she's been in some of the news cycles, including DUI, okay, the driving under the influence. She said that she has been completely sober since her last DUI, which I believe was around the Thanksgiving holiday, 2023, she says she hasn't been drinking. She hasn't been smoking marijuana. So that's another personal choice that she's made. But I just like it when celebrities come out and they share some of the things that they're doing for their health. All right. Y'all make sure that you are liking this video. Please like the video, share the video, share it with friends. Even if they miss this live, they can always go back and they can catch it and they can watch the video. Okay. And be sure you subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell because I will be having more new videos to come out. And also make sure you're following me on Instagram, IG. That's where I kind of give little glimpses into my everyday life. And I do really short little takes of, of different health topics that are in the headlines that come up on a real-time basis. I'm on Facebook as well, LinkedIn, all the social media platforms as at Dr. Dot Frida. I just posted a, an interview I did on a national news show when I was talking about the pig kidney transplant. So if you go to my Instagram page, Facebook, uh, TikTok, you'll see where I posted that video where I'm going into detail about the significance of a genetically modified pig kidney being transplanted into a human being. It can be game changing. 17 people die each day while waiting for a transplant. And with these pig kidneys, more people could get organs. And we know that there are health disparities, racial disparities, black people, Latino people, less likely to get kidney transplants. But with the pig kidney, and I know it sounds a little off-putting to some people, it can feel a little sci-fi, but if it helps to save more lives, then I certainly think we should be for it. Shador, as we get ready to close out, you see any, any more questions, any shout outs, anyone in the, the chat here? Oh, yeah, we have quite a few questions, Dr. Frida. Okay, let's, let's see if there's a couple we can, can take. A couple, couple of them are uh, quite revolve around high blood pressure. When we was talking okay. about. Um, Layla Barnes. She wants Hi, to know, Layla. 
Why is it whenever I visit a doctor, my blood pressure rises at home? It's normal. We get that question a lot in the office. Oh, yeah. And we witness it a lot. Absolutely. So, Ms. Layla, it is possible that you could have white coat hypertension, which is when you're going. First of all, when you get to the office, you're probably hustling and bustling. Who knows if the valet is taking forever, or if you can't go round and round and round in the parking deck. You might have had to tell some people off along the way, had some road rage. So that can cause your cortisol levels to go up. It can cause the adrenaline to go up. And it can cause the blood vessels to constrict, which will give you a high blood pressure. Also, when you're in the doctor's office, when patients come to see me, you don't know what I'm going to say out my mouth about your health. And so there's sometimes a sense of a loss of control and a bit of anxiety that can occur when you're wondering what the doctor is about to tell you. And so that can cause your stress levels to go up. The other thing is that at home, there's a possibility that your blood pressure monitor may not be correct or you may not be taking your blood pressure at home. And even if you're taking it correctly, Ms. Layla, a lot of people don't take it correctly. So I actually have a video um, here on this YouTube channel, Dr. Frida, on how to monitor your blood pressure at home correctly. You want to make sure you look at the size range of the blood pressure cuff because it'll tell you how big your arm should be around the circumference. So if you take a tape, tape measure and you measure your arm like right around this muscle part, the belly of the arm, and see how big it is in inches or in centimeters, make sure that your cuff is the right size. Because if your blood pressure cuff is too big, it'll give you a falsely low blood pressure at home. If your blood pressure cuff is too tight, it'll give you a falsely elevated blood pressure. Also, you want to make sure, even when you're rushing into the doctor's office, that you have an empty bladder. Having a full bladder can give you a falsely elevated blood pressure. And you want to make sure that your feet are uncrossed and your feet are flat. If your feet are crossed and you're sitting there with a full bladder and crossed legs, well, that can cause you to have a falsely elevated blood pressure. You also want to make sure that your arm is at the level of your heart. If your arm is dangling down low, falsely elevated blood pressure. If your arm is up high, falsely low blood pressure. And you have to really pause and be your own advocate because a lot of times the you know physician's assistants or whoever's taking the blood pressure, the nursing staff, they're in a hurry, okay? Big brother is watching. So they might grab you right in after you've been rushing, filling out paperwork, plop you down, take your pressure. But it is okay to say, you know what? let me empty my bladder. Or you know what? I'm a little flustered right now. Can we check the blood pressure after I have time to take in some slow, deep breaths? It's okay for you to advocate for yourself to make sure you get your most accurate reading. But yes, it's very common for people to have high blood pressures in the office. Thank you for that question, that comment. Yeah. And no, no when I have patients, when they come into our office, I always like to chat with them a little bit, what's going on, catch up. Probably maybe five, 10 minutes before I check their blood pressure because a lot of them, their blood pressure a lot elevated. Um, right. versus, you know, what it would typically be at home. So I try to give them a minute. That's true. But Shador, you also have, a, you're a people person. You have that good bedside manner. A lot of people, those doctors are rushing them in and out like it's a factory line. So they're going to have to speak up for themselves if they don't have someone who's good like you who will give them a chance and kind of make them comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Very All good. right. We have a comment from Miss Beverly Cummings. Hi, Miss Beverly Cummings. Thank you for watching. What is the right number? Your blood pressure should be at 875 and over. Good question. So again, I'll give you this information, but the most important thing will be for you to consult with your physician and I'll tell you why. Because a lot of times, and I do this with some of my patients, even though technically the accepted definition of high blood pressure is 130 over 80 and normal is less than 120 over 80. If I have patients who are over 75, who perhaps have balance issues, or if they're on blood thinners, or if they have high risks of falling or high risks of their blood pressure dropping too low, then for some of those patients, I actually will be more liberal and I'll accept their blood pressure if it's 130s over 80s. Again, the de official definition for normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80, hypertension 130 over 80 or greater. But for a lot of my elderly patients, depending on their fall risk or if they're on blood thinners, I will increase that range. There's no set number, but it's an important conversation to have with your physician. And so if you are someone and you've gone in and, you've, and your blood pressure has been 130s over 80s and you've been like, my doctor told me my pressure was fine. Is my doctor telling me a lie? No, not necessarily. They may have decided that based on your history and your risks, that that's an acceptable blood pressure for you and that the benefits of that blood pressure outweigh the risks of it being overshot. So again, individualized conversation, but it's important that you go ahead and give your physician a call to find out the blood pressure that is acceptable and safe for you. All right. Thank you. Uh, I have a two-part question from chatting with Al or Alice. Hi. Uh, so that question is, my, my blood pressure is under control and predicates I no longer take medications. I have CKD stage three, 
what is slow to progression and how long does it take to progress to the next stage of CKD? Very good question. Very good, good question. And so sorry that you have that label of the CKD stage three, chronic kidney disease stage three, but I'm very happy, very happy that it looks like you're taking control of your health and that you have your blood pressure under pretty good control. So high blood pressure, high blood pressure is the second most common cause of kidney failure. OK, so by maintaining a normal blood pressure, you definitely are slowing down the progression of CKD. So kudos to you. The number one cause of kidney failure is diabetes. So you also want to make sure that you maintain normal blood sugar levels, normal blood glucose levels, and that your hemoglobin A1C is checked frequently. That hemoglobin A1C, instead of just giving us a snapshot in time of what your blood sugar is, the hemoglobin A1C lets us know what your blood sugar has been averaging over three months. And so how long does it take to progress? Well, it varies from person to person. Someone who has high blood sugars, high blood pressure, if they're taking a lot of ibuprofen, Motrin, or, or antibiotics that are harmful to the kidneys, certain pain medicines that are harmful to the kidneys. If it's a person who is um, having like very little water in their diet, if they're dehydrated, if they have a high salt diet, if they're eating a lot of added sugar, well, they're going to progress from stage three to stage four pretty rapidly, more likely than not. But if you have someone who's in stage three and they've got good blood sugar control, good blood pressure control, if they have a low salt diet where they're having less than 1,500 milligrams of sodium per day, that's the recommendation from the American Heart Association. If they're staying well hydrated, if they're exercising, if they're meditating, if they're decreasing their stress, all of those things are going to help to slow the progression of CKD. And I have patients who have been in CKD3 for well over a decade OK, and sometimes depending on the cause of their CKD, I have patients who've gone from CKD 3B, which is the worser of the two, up to CKD 3A and even CKD 3 2. Shador has witnessed it in the office. And so that's going to vary from person to person. I will say this. If you're at stage three, it is recommended that you be seen by a kidney specialist, by a nephrologist. So even if your kidney, your um, primary doctor is saying, oh, you're fine, you're fine you at least want to have one evaluation with a nephrologist, a kidney specialist, just to make sure you're doing all the right things. And make sure you watch my video, my YouTube video on CKD stages, where I break down kind of the things to watch out for, like high phosphorus, high potassium, uh, swelling, different symptoms that can occur at each stage. But I wish you the best of luck and congratulations on that blood pressure control. All right. Thank yeah. you. And I have a couple of questions from Nana G. Hi, Nana G. She says, hi, Dr. Frida. I've been watching you for about a year. I finally subscribed. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Uh, she said, don't judge me. I'm saying the same one, so it took a minute. My question is, which you've already addressed, and then she has a second part. Um, I, it's every time my blood pressure in the doctor's office is extremely high. Her second part to that is, um, she didn't take any meds because her blood pressure was never high like it was in the doctor's office at home. It changed her lifestyle, so her blood pressure numbers are uh better and her calcium score is zero. Oh, wow. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, as long as you're managing that blood pressure, as long as you know that your blood pressure cuff is the right size, the right fit. And for the ones at home, it's I prefer that you use the ones on the upper arm. Yes, there are wrist cuffs, you know, and if that's what you have the, and, and you're not able to get on the upper arm one, then you can use a wrist cuff and try to calibrate it like at a fire station with your primary care doctor. But just make sure for all those things I shared earlier on how to monitor pressure normally that you're taking it properly at home. But congratulations on that calcium score. And thank you for watching. And thank you for subscribing to my thank channel. You. I appreciate you. you. I have a couple of questions on cholesterol, if I may. Okay. All right. So we'll start with Miss Marilyn. I'm Miss Marilyn. Hi, Dr. Frida. Does taking cholesterol medicine increase your risk of having diabetes? And does cholesterol medicine cause memory loss and joint pain? Oh, dear. So, <clears throat> again, you're going to need to please consult with your physician because there are, there are lots of different cholesterol medicines. We have the statins, like atorvastatin, simvastatin, rosuvastatin. Then we have niacin. And you got the, there's, there's all different types of cholesterol medicine. Here is the big picture answer for cholesterol medicine. If you're talking about the statins, okay, Lipitor, Zocor, Simvastatin, those things. There have been decades and decades of study. We have so much data to show us that even if you don't have high cholesterol, the statins have been shown to decrease your chances of having a heart attack or a stroke. I mean, we've got evidence out the wazoo. That being said, no medicine is without side effects. And yes, the statins are for lowering cholesterol, especially bad cholesterol, like the LDL, the triglycerides. But there are some side effects and, that people may have. 
You mentioned joint pain. The more common thing is muscle pain or myositis, where you have inflammation of the muscles and especially those proximal muscles like your thighs and your upper arms, where you're in a lot of pain. Some patients, the pain is very severe. And for some people, it can even cause some of the muscle fibers to tear, which can cause can cause other problems like kidney problems. And so You'll look when you look at on the cholesterol medicine, there's always a list of side effects on medicines, a list longer than my arm. But you also want to look at the percentage of people that these side effects in which these side effects occur. And so for most people, not all, for most people, the benefits of taking certain cholesterol medicines like the statins will outweigh the risks. But it's important that you have the conversation with your doctor. And if you're having any of those symptoms, really go through and try to time the symptoms so your doctor can help you to figure out if it really is the cholesterol medicine or if it's something else or something that seems like a coincidence. All right, thank you, Dr. Rita. Um, are there any ways to lower your cholesterol naturally? Absolutely, absolutely. Maintaining a healthy weight is one of them, you know, and then not eating a lot of animal fat, okay? Our bodies actually make most of the cholesterol that we need on our own. And so I don't, so we do actually need cholesterol for certain things. We need cholesterol to make certain hormones. We need cholesterol to make testosterone. Okay. We need testosterone. We need cholesterol for certain things for, for certain parts of our, our cells. We need cholesterol. So it does serve its, pur its purpose. But when we have excess cholesterol, a lot of times when you're eating animal protein, like a lot of red meat, that will worsen it. So having a diet that's mostly plant-based and if you do eat meat, doing mostly like fatty fish, like salmon, tuna, mackerel, halibut. Um, and if you do eat chicken, doing like white meat chicken, taking off the skin, not frying, things of that nature, but mostly plant-based with fruits and vegetables is going to be good. And then high fiber, okay? Having a diet that's high in fiber will help to decrease the bad cholesterol. And having, you know, in hot diets high with in beans, things of that nature are going to help. And then, of course, exercise and again, maintaining a normal or healthy weight. I do have a couple of videos on this YouTube channel on how to low, how to unclog your arteries naturally. And I go into more detail on natural ways to lower your cholesterol. Good question. Yep. Very good question. Thank you. All right. Patrick, uh, we spoke with him earlier. Hi, Patrick. Um, he has a couple of questions. Um, a little off subject, but how do I tell Whoa. my doctor he's scared? You know, Patrick, okay. <laughs> so I guess how do we tell his doctor he's scared in general? Um, he made the comment about the sexual assault earlier in the program. And oh, he also man. wanted to know can he uh, can he have his doctor do the exam? Um in my downtown area laying down. You gotta have a one on one conversation with your doctor. And it's going to be very important that when you make the appointment or even before you make the appointment that you go ahead and share, you share your concerns, you share what happened. And if you are not already being seen by someone who is like a mental health counselor, psychologist, or even psychiatrist, I strongly, strongly suggest you talk to someone who deals with trauma um, because, you know, of course you want your doctor to do the exam in the way that your doctor can do it most effectively. But if this is going to, um, be triggering for you, you want to make sure you have all of the psychological support as well. So please talk to your doctor and make sure you have a doctor you trust where you can ask these questions openly. Thank you. All right. Uh, I have a question from Ms. Monica. Hi, Ms. Monica. Uh, she said, uh, this pertains to, I guess, the donor list. Um, for transplantation. Uh, I thought if you were diabetic, you don't qualify for the donor list. My mother didn't qualify for the donor list because she was diabetic. Okay. So donor versus recipient for the kidney. And uh, and I pray your mom is doing well. So to be a kidney donor, yes, uh, that's someone who is going to donate or to give their kidney to someone who has kidney failure. To be the recipient, you're the kidney patient and you're going to receive it. So if you are going to be giving your kidney and you're the donor, then it's true. If you have diabetes, you won't qualify for it. If you have lupus, no, they're not going to allow you to give the kidney. If you only have one kidney, of course, you can't give it because you need at least one kidney to survive. So that is true. If you're going to be a kidney donor, then you have to be very healthy. You can have high blood pressure, but it has to be well controlled on a small amount of meds. And I recommend for anyone who's listening to this information, 
go to the transplant center yourself or talk to the person who's a kidney patient and say, hey, I'm not sure if I'm going to qualify to be a donor, but I want to get tested. Let Don't sit and disqualify yourself at home. Go and get tested. And so if that's what you're talking about, then yes, if your mom is going to be a donor of the kidney, then if she has diabetes, she cannot be because as we discussed, diabetes is the number one cause of kidney failure. And the transplant clinics don't only protect the recipients, they don't, they don't only protect the kidney patients, they also protect the donors. And so if someone has diabetes, lupus, uncontrolled hypertension, then they're not going to let you give away your kidney knowing that you could be at risk of getting kidney disease yourself. All right. Thank you. Just a few more questions. I'll free to a shout out if I may. Um, okay. So I think you might have spoke, misspoke earlier about the exercise and things of that nature when we were speaking of the Olympic and diet and exercise. Um, so Ms. Donald kind of caught, caught you out a little bit. She said 30 minutes, five times a day. I think you misspoke on that. It's a bit much. I'm an RN and know you meant five times a week. Oh, absolutely. Yes. So American Heart Association recommends 150 minutes per week. So yes, if you divvy that up in five days, that would be 30 minutes, five times per week. Exactly. You'll fall out probably do it in one day. Thank you. All right. Thank you for addressing that. I have another question from Miss Linda. Why does alcohol cause seizures? Oh, so yeah. So, you know, the alcohol, it is a central nervous system depressant. Okay. You know, your brain, your spinal cord, those are in the central nervous system. So with the alcohol, what it can do in some patients, it can lower the seizure threshold, meaning what activity normally would not cause a seizure. Once you have the alcohol and you've had the overstimulation of the brain, it can cause you to have a seizure. Um, but oftentimes patients will already have a predisposition to seizure disorder. But yeah, but it's, it's directly acting on the, the central nervous system. All right. Thank you. And then Ms. Norma. Hi, Ms. Norma. Hi, Ms. Norma. Can you please tell me what my pulse should be? I'm 51. So what's a normal pulse? Okay. I'll give you this answer. And again, you want to consult with your physician because if you're someone who's very athletic, if you're a runner, you run marathons, you run, you know, very often, or you, you know, you have a lot of high physical activity, then a normal pulse for you might be lower than what's normal for other people. Okay. But the pulse that is considered normal, the heart rate range is between 60 and 100 beats per minute, between 60 and 100 beats per minute. And again, some athletes will have a resting heart rate in the 50s or even high 40s for some people. Um, and you have other people who may have a heart rate where 102, 103, 104 might be normal for them. At any heart rate, it should be regular. So if you have an irregular rhythm, especially an irregularly irregular rhythm, that can mean that you could have something like AFib or atrial fibrillation, which could lead to blood clots in the heart, strokes, things of that nature. But yeah. The general answer is 60 to 100, but consult your physician to find out what heart rate is normal for you. Also, there's some medications that can affect your heart rate. So if you're on a beta blocker like metoprolol, toprol, carvedilol, um, labetalol, atenolol, then these are medications that can slow down your heart rate. OK, so if you're noticing that oh, all of a sudden my heart rate's slow, look at your medication list. If you're on any of those medications, you want to consult with your physician or if you're just not sure if you're on a medication that's slowing down your heart rate consult with their physician and find out if it's a side effect. All right. Questions. I'm going to close it with our last, I'm going to shout out, and then she has a couple comments. It's Pat D. She's been with us Hi, since, I've been seeing her since we started last um, beginning of the month. So she's been oh, here every single thank week. Thank you. I appreciate you. Okay. Uh, she says, Hi, Dr. Frieda and Shador. Keep up the good work going. I am late today. Uh, her question is, is the uh, glucosamine okay to take with no meds or my blood pressure med medications. Now for the, the medication one, I'm going to ask you to consult with your physician, especially since uh, I don't know if your physician actually recommended that or if that's something that you kind of gone and picked up. And because I don't know your whole history and physical to be able to advise you on that, but it's definitely worth the phone call to your doctor to, to let you know on that specific piece of medical advice, because I would need to know more. Yeah. But I certainly thank you for your support. We appreciate you. All right, Dr. Frieda. All right. Well, that was fun. We got a lot of interaction today. This is great. So I will see y'all. We'll see y'all next Monday for our Medical Mondays, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on Medicine in the News on our YouTube Live. Again, make sure, don't leave this room without liking the video, please. Come on, help us out. Like it, share it, subscribe to the channel. 
and you can still share the link with people who weren't able to make it and they can go back and they can they can watch the replay and they can comment and ask questions there as well. Thank you, Shador, again, my wonderful co-host, who's also been my practice manager for over a decade. So she's seen it all in our office in Midtown Atlanta Nephrology. Again, make sure you are subscribed to this YouTube channel. Hit the notification button. Follow me on all social media platforms on my Instagram at dr.freed. You'll see a little different side of me, but child, I just go and post whatever or more of what's going on in my everyday life. Appreciate y'all. And we will see y'all next week on Monday, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a good night.